Thank you, Ranto. We have about 10 minutes for Eight. the shortest and most uncomfortable <laughs> Q&A on the planet. So we're standing here like two stand-up comedians <laughs> and we're timed for about 10 minutes. So I immediately wanted to jump aboard and ask okay. you about um, it, if I summarize the press releases around the film or film project River Fundament, it basically says that part of the film is structured around a wake in the house of the dead uh, novelist Norman Mailer, and it is also um, inspired by his novel Agent Evenings. Mm -hmm. And knowing some of you, most of you, I think, know Norman Mailer because of his award-winning novels, The Dead and the Naked and The Executioner's Song, but Ancient Evenings is actually his most ill-reputed novel. It's been annihilated by the critical press. It's been called unmitigated rubbish, but it's also been called a visionary epic tale, one in which Mailer basically, again summarizing, he uh, gives his version of the ancient Egyptian belief in the seven stages of the soul from death to rebirth and adds a, let's say, severely sexual twist to it. Could, could you explain to us or talk to us about how this novel has inspired a project, or is it just a sideline, or in how much was this really a source or a muse? Right. Well, I can say that uh, I, I believe Norman Mailer was, at, later in his life, was looking around for people who might make, because a couple of his novels had been made into films, and so, um, it's been said that he was looking around for directors for mm -hmm. certain of his projects, and so um, it was no. Uh, he had been involved in a crewmaster film. He was acting in a crewmaster film, so he was friends with Matthew and, and important to Matthew. But it kind of made sense that for this kind of um, most challenging novel of his, that he went to Matthew and asked him if he might direct something because thought he could sort of deal with the the, complexity. the weirdness yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, and um, back in this time, it was after the Cream Master, Matthew and I were speaking about doing something live, uh, and doing something that could be, maybe you could call it an opera, but I mean, something where there's music on, on a stage, you could call an opera. And it was around the time when he started uh, looking at, the, at that novel, and so I remember he and I were sitting down in my studio and we just went through the first 100 pages of it, and it was really... The first 100 pages are told from the point of view of someone who is dead and is kind of waking up and they're in, in a crypt in ancient Egypt and they, they become, they're becoming aware that they are being mummified so that parts of their body are being removed and treated and put back in. And, so, and somehow there was, I've never heard such a, it was such a beautifully operatic, uh, <laughs> you know, setting, yeah, so it, so it was immediately, um, attractive to do something. And then we started speaking about it, and I think within that first meeting it became clear that it would have to be, you know, seven, you know, seven acts, one for each uh, uh, level of the soul, and that then it expanded, even within an hour it expanded that, that each act should have its own location, you know, so its own sort of situation. But, yeah. and, and, and you have worked with Matthew Barney extensively, I mean, almost as, I think, there is a sense of mystery around duos or people who collaborate, whether or not they're partners. As a viewer, you're always really curious about the magic of that collaboration. You want to know how does it work? What is the methodology? Is there anything you could tell us about that? Because I imagine it's a very intrinsic trajectory. But how do two minds come up with this kind of elaborate film? Well. I have to say, I mean, one of the most valuable things is probably uh, the, the difference between us and how we are allowed to be different and sort of function in parallel and that these things kind of, they work together. So we're not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to be like him or trying to, and, and vice versa. I think often we don't really understand each other and that's what keeps it, uh, in a way, compelling, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't understand his stuff, and I, and often <laughs> when we <laughs> when we um, and I think he also doesn't, you know, I mean, so we work in parallel, and it's quite intense. Often the projects are pretty large scale, and a lot has to happen. So we'll work in parallel such that when I arrive on 
on the set, for example. I mean, because often the idea is, or my idea is to try to, to have as much of the music happen in, you know, on screen or in within the, the piece itself, um, and to avoid sort of film score, like scoring something after the fact. But so often we'll arrive on, on set together or at at a performance, and we won't be quite sure what each other is going to do. You don't really <laughs> talk about it beforehand, we you just, just do it? I mean, we talk quite a bit, but, it, but it, I think we trust each other enough, you know, that we don't need to know everything. Like, are you sure we're gonna, this is going to be okay, and I want to make sure that it's not going to be too loud, this sort of thing. Yeah. We just kind of go for it. Is it, is it too <laughs> romantic, an idea to think that, so there's a natural symbiosis that happens at the moment of performing, or is that too romantic? That, that's a little romantic to speak about two, two gentlemen. No. No, it's not. <laughs> no, I think it's also the natural, whatever the word, the opposite of it is, you know, the antithesis or whatever the word is. Um, that, that there's there's a, yeah, that there's a natural difference is what I'm saying. And, and uh, which also, you know, which is important. And could you separate, because in, in most of the um, reviews and press releases, the musical component is described as an autonomous entity that actually embodies subliminal motives in the film. Could it really exist and as an independent project? Or how, I mean, it's difficult, I think, for everybody in the room to understand without having seen the project. They're intertwined, but they're autonomous at the same time. How does that work for you as a composer? Well, I mean, I think because it's my life's work, Really, because I've done, done so much. I mean, a lot of my my own the development of my work has happened in this context. Um, that it is, it's important for me that it's not just music for this film, you know. And then I think it does it does come across that way. I don't think it has to exist by itself, you know. It's 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 nice that it has a it's nice the way again they things is, exist kind of in parallel. But I, I think we share. Um, you know, for example, for me it's become very important, while I don't like to make film score, but I, I've found that I can't start writing something before I understand the, the whole context. And I, I think I see it a bit as a live, as though it were a live performance. So to understand the space and how the, how the sound is, how can be part of that space, and yes, I think I do see it as um, the music as a character itself, itself, or sometimes the space itself, and um, <laughs> so just an, an, an object also, yeah. along with the objects. So. And within the, we were talking a little bit in the foyer about, not, well, this is a six hour long film slash project slash opera, mm. um, that you could look from, at, from the perspective of the viewer as being very demanding, a sort of, exercise in endurance, but also from a construction perspective. How do you make a six hour long epic? How do you go about constructing such a thing? Right. Well, I can say that well, that wasn't really, you know, the idea. Let's say I'll make something hugely long that's twice as long as Wagner and people won't be able to sit through it. That certainly was not an interest. <laughs> um, but I find it really valuable um, when you do something that takes years to make. Um, that when you you start by doing, you know, we started doing one facet of it, which was a large event in Los Angeles with a, a day-long performance with tons of performers, and that was 2008. So by the time we finished it, that you know, it was five six years later, um, and that that layering of something that's happened in the past but is part of the piece, so your influences are your are yourself in a way, like something that you had done years before. You want to, you allow yourself to be influenced by that and sort of include that material, but you're including it for you know from a different perspective than you had when you were making it. That's a that's really a, a, a kind of privilege to be able to to work with something yeah. like, you know over that, that amount of time. And do you do you wish to? Because I think the Cream Master Cycle, as much as this film, is. Very, it's a very complex web of also references and quotes to your own work, but to other people's work. It, 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 and there's literary figures who appear in it, like Salman Rushdie, Jeffrey Eugenides. It's 
incredibly dense. Do you think it's important that a viewer kind of decodes all the symbols and metaphors, or is it more about the experience as a totality? Yeah, I, I don't think it's important to understand what's happening. Sorry. No, but this is, I think, a perfect ending to your viewing experience. It's not important to understand everything. I think that excellently prepares everyone for the ride to come. Thank you very much. Thanks. Jonathan.